Welcome to Living Blind. I'm Jeffrey Rainey, the podcast producer and your guest host for this episode. The Living Blind podcast is brought to you by Balance for Blind Adults, located in Toronto, Canada, and this season is sponsored by AMI. Here at Living Blind, we explore the perspectives and lived experiences of people with sight loss and delve into barriers, challenges, and real-life strategies for living life to the fullest. Well, listeners, summer's here! And in honor of the weather heating up and the world continuing to open up, we thought it would be a good idea to revisit one of our early episodes all about exploring the great outdoors with the ever-adventurous Lauren Scunther. Lauren Scunther is North America's only blind conservationist and professional angler, as well as an outdoor writer, podcaster, blogger, filmmaker, and TV host. Having lost his vision at age 8, Lauren supplies his outdoor experience, masters in environmental studies, local knowledge, and ability to envisage nature with unique and insightful results. Our host Naomi Hazlitt speaks with Lawrence about bird watching, fishing, sailing, boating, cooking and barbecuing, and much more. Lawrence gives advice on how to navigate the outdoors using all five senses, along with the role that technology can serve and some of the tech items he's found useful. Happy listening. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Oh, thanks for having me. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yeah, beautiful day out. You know, I want to get outside. I want to go start doing things again. I miss uh, the uh, I miss nature, and it hasn't been easy to get into nature with COVID nineteen and everyone staying home and you know isolating and social distancing. I think it's that has really impacted the ability for so many of us who have uh, visual disabilities, who can't drive, who depend on other people for an elbow or for a ride, um, just to get outdoors. You know, it's not the same as to go into your local park as it is to really get outdoors. For sure. How have you been managing with that? A lot of walks around the neighborhood, you know, really exploring the neighborhood. And, you know, with my two youngest kids at home, um, I take them out every day with our dogs, my guide dog and our family dog. And every day, you know, since COVID began, we've, we've been walking and we learned where not to walk, you know, where we might encounter more people that we don't want to encounter on sidewalks, uh, crowds maybe. And, and uh, you know, the streets we nor normally wouldn't walk on, we've learned to walk on because they're less vehicles and they're more pleasant now. And really what we've done is we've explored all the architecture but now our walks are really based around which, which streets have the most birds? Because we love walking down the streets that have all the birds. Oh, really? Are you a, are you a bird watcher or a bird listener? I, I am more than ever this year, just because of all the walks and uh, all the bird listening, you know, that's my way of connecting with nature. And, and there's some research on that as well. When you walk in the outdoors, if it's totally silent, it's, it's still nice and it's still pleasant and beneficial, but if you're walking in the outdoors and there's lots of bird sounds, it's way more beneficial for your mental health. And uh, there's a lot of research on that. And surprisingly, a lot of vision impaired people have been taking up bird listening and list. And there's all sorts of courses on there out there now on online that are accessible. There's apps you can download onto your uh, smartphone that will listen to the birds and tell you what the name of those birds are. So, uh, it, and then it puts it into a database, a central database. So uh, we're, we're participating in citizen science as well. That's great that you can not only enjoy a hobby, but you're actually helping other people enjoy the hobby at the same time. I think that's important. You know, when you really get into something, you want to share your knowledge and share your experience. And, and you want to investigate, right? It's all about learning and discovering. You can do that online, but at some point you also need to do that out in the real world because those experiences are the ones that are really impactful. When you're experiencing nature with all your senses, with your body, taste, touch, smell, you know, feel, uh, you know, and sight if, if possible, all of that adds up to a, a, a real holistic type of a experience that is much more, impactful and, and I, I know like I'm getting up there a little bit in age and smell memories uh, to me you know as my visual memories faded away you know because I'm now totally blind I was registered blind at age eight but I could still see quite a bit and right through my 20s 
but most of those visual Im images have have sort of deteriorated in my mind but those smell memories when i when i have a trigger a smell memory those are really powerful i, I really enjoy smell memories you're making me think about campfires, which is one of my favorite smells outdoors. Can you tell me about some of your favorite smells? Um, you know, just water, the smell of water, the smell of an ocean, the smell of being on a lake, smell of being by the river in a forest of pine trees or spruce trees. They all have different smells. I know, you know, you get into a taxi, you get way too much pine scent. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> You know, just leaves like my favorite season is the fall because all those leaves on the ground, you've got that sort of beginning of the uh, compensate, uh, you know, they start to decompose and there's, there's that earthy smell of the leaves and the earth. And it just, it's a, a real primal sort of smell. And uh, as opposed to spring, which is all about frozen things, you know, now becoming unfrozen and starting to uh, deteriorate all at once, that can be a bit overwhelming. I, I'm much more of a fall smell person, but summer smells as well. And, and winter, well, the winter, there's not a lot of smells because the humidity is gone in the winter time normally. And with, and humidity is what carries the smell to your to your nose. So without humidity in the air, there's much less smell in the in the air in the winter time. Hmm. You know, taking a step back for a moment, you mentioned that taking a hike or going on a walk can be a multi-sensory experience. And so far we've talked about smell and we've talked about hearing birds. Can you talk a little bit more about what sorts of senses you're experiencing or what sorts of things that you encounter, whether it's a walk around the block or a walk in the woods? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, people love to see animals, uh, squirrels, you know, to me, squirrels are more fun for me when my dog spots them and uh, my family dog and they react to squirrels and things like that. And, and uh, so it, there's all the visual things, those visual uh, stimulations that in the forest that sighted people benefit from. And I'm not saying that as a blind person, you can't benefit from that. Because when you walk around large trees and there's wind, a little bit of breeze in the air, and you hear the wind passing through the treetops way above you, it's, it's quite an interesting sound. I mean, some forests like poplar or birch trees, when those leaves rattle in the wind, it's almost a cacophony. You know, it's almost too much. I had a property out in Cape Breton and uh, poplar trees grow like weeds. And it's always, there's always a wind coming off the ocean there. So the poplar trees just rattle and shake and rattle and shake. And it's almost overwhelming. It, it, was, it was just an acre of land, but it was right on the coast. So I, over the years, I eliminated the poplar trees and planted pine trees. And at some point, my 200 feet of shoreline was just pine trees. And it got to the point where I didn't realize this, but I, I discovered it quite by accident. I was out in my rowboat and I got a little far from shore and I wasn't quite sure which way to how to get back to land. And then I thought, well, okay, because my, my technology sort of crapped out on me, which it can. So I, I just stopped rowing and I listened and I could hear the shoreline because you can always hear the shoreline unless you're way out there, but you know, normally always hear the shoreline. And I listened and I realized that my property was the patch of shoreline that was making no noise. So I, I, I steered back to the silent spot on the shore and that was the pine trees because the pine trees, it's just a, you know, it's just a soft wind sound. Whereas all the birch trees and poplar trees are rattling like maniacs, you know, and just creating that huge soundscape. I, I from then on, I, I gave a whole new value to the pine trees I had planted on the property and how much they had grown and, and taken over. And uh, I really love that. I really love that feeling and the smell of the pine and the sound of the pine trees. I was going to ask you, how did you get into outdoor activities? But I feel like you're answering it for me already. There's so much to experience, whether it's sound or smell or touch outdoors. But tell me a little bit more about what you do in nature. I know you have a boat. Uh, what kinds of activities do you like to do uh, when you're out there? I think fishing, <clears throat> fishing is one of the uh, activities. 
that allows you to sort of connect with nature in very real ways. You know, you bird watchers uh, spot birds with binoculars and you can see animals, deers and bears and things like that as well if you're in the right spot at the right time. Um, with fishing, it's an underwater world that's largely unseen by everybody. Everyone is fishing blind. Fishing rods are really just white canes, you know, really fancy carbon white canes. Because if you think about what, what does a fishing rod do? You can launch a lure out there and then you can reel the lure back. You can control the line coming into the reel and guide that fishing line onto your reel with your fishing rod. You can set the hook, you can play the fish, but 99% of the time you're feeling with your fishing rod. You're feeling what's down there. That, that sensation of your lure through the line into the rod and down the rod into the handle and into your hands. It's like, your white cane is all of a sudden a hundred feet long because that's how far you can feel out with your fishing rod. It's, you can feel out as far as you can cast. And with the newer fishing lines, like braided fishing lines and, and the high carbon fishing rods, they're super sensitive. So you can feel what's down below. If there's weeds or stumps or rocks or gravel or mud, you can feel the fish bite. You can tell what kind of fish are biting. You can, <clears throat> You can experience all that. You can tell how deep the water is, how fast the water is moving. And then when you catch a fish, you can hold that fish and smell the fish and feel its life and put that fish back. Or if you want to take one home and eat it, you know, eating a fish is the most, it's the most fundamental way to connect with nature. Because what you're saying is all of nature is good and healthy and I'm healthy and I'm eating as an apex predator. I'm eating at the top of the food chain and all the rest of the life below me is safe and healthy and sustainable. So you want to make sure you're making the right choices when you do decide to keep a fish and bring it home and feed yourself or your family with it. But it is a, it's a very special experience to eat a wild fish. Mm -hmm. And it really is a connection to nature and a, and, a, and a statement in nature saying nature is healthy, nature is safe. And if I'm going to do this and my children and their children are going to do this. We have to keep it that way. Yeah. You're speaking to a sustainability piece around being connected to what you eat and, and where it lives. Mm -hmm. Yep. The water, the habitat, the, the food chain, everything, right. From the zooplankton and phytoplankton all the way up. Mm -hmm. Do you like to cook as well? I do. Yeah. It's another sensory experience, you know, sound, touch, smell, taste, uh, you know, there's so many ways to cook. I have a, a big pans. I have a cast iron to cook over fire. I have a grill. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, cooking on the stove, even I love cooking and, uh, it, I get a lot of pleasure from it and there's ways to do it, uh, just by smelling and tasting and touching. You don't have to see the food as it's cooking. You can tell how it's cooking, you know, with a barbecue, especially, most people barbecue now it's the lids down, right? The only time you put the lid up is to put the food on to take the food off or to flip it over. But the cooking takes place with the lid down. Now sighted people, they'll watch the, they'll watch the thermometer built into barbecues and make sure it doesn't get too hot or too cold. But if you know your barbecue, you know how to heat it up. You know how to put it to the right temperature just by the knob placement. You know your grill, you know the hot spots on your grill, the cooler areas of your grill, the, the areas that are sort of medium heat. So you know where to place your food and for quick or slow or slow it down. And, um, and you, you can know by the smell how, how your food is cooking. And when it's, you know, just perfectly ready is, and, and touch as well. I can always keep a, a damp paper towel with me. And if I'm cooking meat, I just touch it with my finger and push on it a little bit. And how much resistance there is will determine how, how well it's cooked. So if you say, for instance, if you, with your left hand, if you touch your thumb to your index finger, that would be a rare steak and it, your, your first finger. And then your second finger would be a medium rare. Your third finger would be a, a medium well, and then your pinky finger to your thumb, it would be well. And what you're doing is when you're moving your thumb to each of these fingers, you're feeling with your other hand, the thumb pad. So as you push on your thumb pad with your other, other hand, you can feel it getting harder and harder and harder as you move your thumb from the biggest first finger all the way down to your pinky finger. And, and that's what the meat should feel like. 
So that's how you can tell, you know, rare, medium, rare, well, medium, uh, you know, medium, well, and all that. It's uh, so you get a, get a feel. People say, oh, I like a medium rare. So just go by the touch. And then I keep the paper towel. I just wipe my finger with it all the time. So it doesn't burn because the burn doesn't happen when you touch it's it's if you get stuff something stuck to your finger like a kernel of uh, salt or pepper that can continue to burn so you want to wipe that off right away i'm glad you brought that up because i don't think we've ever had anybody talk about barbecuing before and you're it makes a lot of sense to me that you're cooking most of the time with the lid down so it's a lot about timing and and placement and not necessarily looking at the food while it's cooking having a good timer is very important for sure <laughs> yeah if you don't want to ruin your steak you definitely want to keep a timer handy i always have my smart speaker say hey gg or aa set the time for uh set an alarm for four minutes and then i know four minutes i flip it for a burger i i flip every eight minutes for a steak every four minutes but different heat zones but that's general the general rule Right. It's, uh, I'm not much of a barbecuer myself, so I'm taking notes <laughs> as we go along. <laughs> and now a message from our sponsor. Discover AMI's collection of podcasts created by and for the blind and partially sighted community. Visit ami.ca to learn more. AMI entertains, informs, and empowers. And now back to the podcast. So on that note, actually, you're mentioning a little bit around timers or tech. What sorts mm -hmm. of technology, when it doesn't crap out, I guess, do you use when you're when you're out and about outdoors? Well, technology will always fail. Count on that. That's one thing you always need to be able to count on is that it will fail. Everyone who is uh, uses technology knows that has that experience. It might not happen often, but it will happen. And uh, so you need to be careful. A lot of people say, you know, there's a lot of people out there sailing beautiful sailboats now, and they're just using GPS to part uh, track their course and uh, figure out where they're going from and how to get back. And uh, if your GPS can fail, and it, it does, you know, things can happen. And if you don't have a way of sailing your boat that doesn't involve GPS, you're really setting yourself up for a potential disaster. So when I'm out in my blind fishing boat, and if you want to learn more about that, just visit blindfishingboat.com. And there's all sorts of information there about technology and the way I set up this little plastic boat that has an electric motor that I've uh, been playing around with for the last 15 years. And I've changed the technology and I continue to change it. I'm always learning and exploring new things. But uh, really, I also am depending on my senses, the way I sail. Right? Blind sailors sail with the wind on their face. They, they don't use technology on, on sailboats when they're racing. Um, you know, they have some sighted people on board to make sure they don't crash into things. But uh, it's all about the feel of the waves, the sound of uh, what's around you, and, and the, mainly the feel of the wind on your face. That's how you know. The wind is pretty consistent. So if you leave and the wind's on your left cheek and you come back and the wind is on your right cheek, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Now, it won't get you exactly where you need to be, but it'll keep you going in a, in a straight course. And being in the water is the most difficult thing is to go straight. It's like when you're walking in a field, right? Once you leave the sidewalk, it's, it's hard to go straight. Yeah, sidewalks are pretty simple. You know, it's like a training wheels on a, on a bicycle. You can't really mess up, you know, you can go forward and you go backwards, but you, if you turn one way, you'll hit the lawn. If you turn the other way, you hit the street. So sidewalks are pretty, pretty simple things to walk on, but you're walking on a field, you really need to get a, a, a navigational aids. And if you're on the water, you can spin around pretty quick in a, any type of watercraft. So under just keeping your direction, your sense of direction and not panicking, um, that comes down to like I said, the sun on your face, the wind on your face, the feel of the waves, the sound of the shore, those types of things. But then once, if you really want to navigate and you want to get somewhere, you can create waypoints with the uh, Victor Trekker uh, system. It's a GPS that allows you to create your own waypoints and it'll navigate you there, you know, 
462 meters uh, one o'clock. So it gives you a little direction and how far you are away from your waypoint when you select it. It navigates you there in a straight line. So you have to make sure there's nothing between you and the place you want to get to on the water, like an island. <laughs> <laughs> or <it'll> be a surprise. <laughs> uh, uh, your, you know, your most all smartphones now have uh, compasses, and uh, and now you know a lot of these phones, like the iPhones, are pretty water resistant, so you don't have to worry too much about them getting splashed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of tech that's made for blind, low vision people that really is not um, hardened for outdoor use it's 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 a very fragile a lot of the stuff but the more and more it's getting tougher and the iphones and, and so on are getting tougher so there's a lot of devices on your smartphone that you can download gps and compasses type devices that can get you tell you where you are and what direction you're heading in create waypoints so you can get from one waypoint to another to another and to another and then work your way back again once you create your waypoints on a body of water you can become quite familiar with it. You know, okay, I'm leaving here. This is my launch point. This is my first place where I like to, um, you know, get out of the wind. Here's a place where I know I can do some fishing. Here's a place that has a nice beach, you know, for a picnic. And uh, you don't have to go far, right? You don't, I'm not talking miles and miles, but uh, you can do a lot within a kilometer. I like how you're speaking to the fact that there's tech out there that can definitely enhance the experience. But at the end of the day, you can also trust yourself and you know the, the, the cues that nature is giving you, like the wind, like sound. So you don't necessarily have to rely on a smartphone to be able to go out there and enjoy the outdoors. No, it shouldn't be. Like I said, the technology will fail you. Your, your battery could die. <laughs> so you definitely need to have some backup systems for sure and be comfortable. But if you think about all the, the, the fishers that plied the East Coast of Canada for 500 years in their wooden, homemade wooden boats, fishing boats, they never had technology. Most of them never even had compasses. They, what they had was the ability to smell land, the, 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 the understand how waves feel different as you approach land, the sound of, of the waves rolling up on the shore, and how to pick your find the inlet between the shore to get you into your bay by the lack of sound and steering for that, that soundless spot on the shore where the way where there are no waves crashing up. They, they, you know, they would do this all the time in the fog, they'd be able to leave their rocky shoreline, go out and fish and come back. And, you know, quite often there was fog. So they knew they needed to know how to get back home in the fog. And they never had radar or anything like that. And they did it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, I'm not saying all of them were successful. There's a lot of wrecks, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in the big picture, right? They, they do it. They continue to do it. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a good point. I think another thing we haven't talked about as much is you have a furry friend that sometimes comes along for the ride. So can you talk a little bit about your guide dog and what you do together when you're out exploring the woods or the outdoors? I got my first guide dog in 1986. I think I was the first, uh, one of the first 10 people in Ontario to get a guide dog. And um, I never even owned a white cane at that point. I, I could still see enough to walk around. Uh, but a guy I knew, an older gentleman who used a white cane, he was totally blind. Uh, he was working downtown and then he was off, off work for a couple of weeks and I asked him what happened. And he came back to work and I said, what happened? He goes, he's Lawrence. He said, I was in the subway system and I forgot what level I was on. And I walked right off the platform, landed on the tracks. Oh no. Yeah. With his white cane. He just wasn't thinking, right. He was end of the long day. He was tired. So he, he went and got himself a guide dog and, uh, and I met the guide dog and it sounded amazing. So I went and got myself a guide dog. And uh, like I said, I could still see enough and in, in good conditions to walk around without anything. But at night, I couldn't see anymore. Or if I was outside in the wintertime, and there's a lot of snow, and then I walk inside, because I only had uh, peripheral vision, you know, I couldn't see anything because my pupil would become very, very pinhole size, I'd walk in, into a building. And my, you know, your, your, your pupils don't dilate that quickly. And my pupils have to be quite large to let light into the peripheral area of my eyes. But that takes that can take 30 minutes, you know, when you come in 
inside from out from outdoors where it's really sunny and, and bright because of the snow and uh, for university you don't have 30 minutes to get to class you know <laughs> you're always running late so a guide dog it was it became really handy to get to class and to get to work in the evenings where i worked at a group home and uh and during the day he was just sort of my pet like uh during the day we just walk around together and he could tell i could see where i was going but over the 10 years i had that first dog my eyesight continued to deteriorate and at some point i realized uh by the around you know 10 years or so that my dog was now guiding me almost all the time you know mm-hmm. whereas for first i was i was walking him around most of the time and and now he was guiding me almost you know all the time and and uh it was uh it was a realization you know when you go blind so slowly you don't really notice it until you think back and say hey i, I used to be able to do that and that now i can't anymore because you're constantly adjusting you're constantly you know trying to maintain that balance in your life of things you can do and um and and things you can't do they just sort of drop off the uh, table and you don't think about them anymore you replace them with something else so you're constantly and that's what's what life is all about right it's on constant adjustments you know there's always things that are going to limit what you can and can't do whether it's just physical fitness or health condition or eyesight or hearing or work or marriage or children or you know do you have the money there's always things you're adjusting and that's what life's all about so you know blindness is just one more thing but it's when you look back uh, if you're like me you lost you're losing your sight very slowly over your life you realize, you know, there was a lot of things you could do. And now you've replaced them with a lot of things you, you could still do, but they're different things. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's a, you have to accept that and, and grieve those losses. But if you, if you don't go through that grieving and re- recognition and, and, and sadness and, you know, that whole grieving process about the loss, you, you might not really learn from it. And you might not really, it might affect you in other ways. You might become unhappy, unhealthy, um you know maybe you're depressed and you won't even notice so yeah uh, grieve your losses and then when you finish that grieving process you'll be in a much better uh, state of mind to say okay here's where i am now what what next and that's mm-hmm. life what's next that's true what do you feel like was helpful for you through that grieving process if you don't mind me asking talking to people I used to think people that wanted to talk about their impediments and their shortcomings and their disabilities to be very boring. You know, when you're young, you think, oh, man, why are you focusing on that all the time? That's so defeatist. That's so negative. That's so, you know, unproductive. Let's just do stuff. Let's just do stuff and, and, and not think about that. But, you know, having someone you can talk to, and I'm not saying it has to be with friends. Um, sometimes it's good to have someone you can talk to that just it's a safe place where you can go and share your thoughts and and you know it's not going to go any further and then you feel better afterwards well quite often you feel miserable afterwards because you just explored a whole bunch of things you've been refusing to deal with for a while (laughs) but then you deal with it you get over it and you get on with life but you don't need to dump that stuff on your friends necessarily because people don't forget. And, uh, and sometimes a friendship is about sharing experiences. It's they're not necessarily friendships are there for you to be to count on for psychological or mental health support. You know, when they say, Hey, you know, you seem a bit down these days, you know, someone says that to you, you know, instead of turning to them and, and just dumping all your, your blues and stories and feelings and your about the grieving or whatever you're going through, maybe find someone that is can listen and where you can lay all that out and then walk away and say, huh, that feel felt good to get that off my chest. I feel better, but you also know that it's, it's, you sort of left it behind and it's not going to haunt you. It's not going to be in the minds of your friends and they're not going to keep bringing it up and talking about it or sharing that news with other people or whatever, you know? So yeah, there's friendships are good, but you have to protect your friendships too. Oh, that's well said. Do you have any final words of advice for someone who's listening to the podcast and thinking I've never 
done any outdoor activities before, where, where do I start? What would you say to them? There's not a lot of books written about how to do stuff as a blind person. There's a lot of podcasts out there on how to do technology and how to master your technology, but mastering your technology, you know, technology can help you get to do the things you want to do, like a job, like school, like communication and accessing information, storing, retrieving, all of that stuff is super important. But is it, is it a, something you want to do is it, it's, or is it a means to give you the ability to do what you want to do? Sometimes it's like a car, right? It's, you know, you don't own a car just for the sake of owning a car. Car is just transportation to get you to the places you want to be. So treat your technology like that and, and figure out ways to do things as a person with low vision or no vision, and then share that information because that's really cool stuff. And, and not enough people are talking about that, like being in the outdoors. You know, how do you do stuff in the outdoors? I've been sharing tips with you today. And um, you can search high and low on the internet for this sort of information, and you're not going to find it that easily. So the more of us that do this and learn about it and share our experiences, the more people will be able to do it without having to reinvent the wheel for themselves. That makes sense. Talk to people. Don't mm. go. Don't do it alone. You know. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time, Lawrence. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And with that. That does it for another episode of Living Blind. Thanks for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed this interview with Lauren Scunther as much as we enjoyed doing it for you. After listening to that, I want to get outside right now, and I'm sure you do too. No matter where you live, it's likely that there are organizations you can explore that will help you be more active in the out of doors in your community. We've included some resources in the show notes for listeners living in the greater Toronto area but all over the world, there are such opportunities. We've also got more information about Lawrence and his many projects in the show notes as well, so be sure to check those out. This wraps up our second season of the podcast. We will be back in September with fresh new installments to kick off season three, during which topics will range from adaptive daily living strategies and equipment, to computer gaming, to working in theater arts, and much, much more. And of course, we are always looking for new guests to feature. If you have a story you would like to tell on the podcast, a person you would like us to interview, or a topic you would like us to cover, please send your ideas to livingblindpodcast at balancefba.org. Special thanks to Lawrence Gunther, our host Naomi Hazlitt, executive producer Deborah Gold, and the entire team at Balance for Blind Adults. If you like what you heard today, feel free to subscribe, rate, and review us on whichever platform you're listening on. And don't forget to let us know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter by searching Balance for Blind Adults. You can also email the podcast with any comments, questions, or suggestions you might have at livingblindpodcast at balancefba.org. For more information about Balance for Blind Adults and our programs and services, or to access the show notes or the transcription of this episode, please visit us at www.balancefba.org. I'm Jeffrey Rainey, and this has been Living Blind. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in September. Hi, everyone. It's Deborah Gold, Executive Director of Balance for Blind Adults. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Living Blind podcast. Our team is so very pleased to bring you these monthly shows focused on the lived experiences and stories of people with sight loss. The podcast is made possible through the generosity of our donors. If you'd like to support this content with a donation, please visit our website at www.balancefba.org. The information about how to donate is also in our show notes. Thanks for listening.